So, good evening. Welcome to the uh, monthly meeting of the Environmental Services Committee. And we're meetings been held here in the Grange, and we have councillors in the chamber and online with WebEx. So, uh, first item on the agenda is apologies. So, first of all, I'm going to go to Councillor Tommy Maguire. Sorry, Tommy. I go on, I carry Neil Glasgow, a wine on group of him, Fian and Oct. Just one apology from uh, Collier Barry Michael Duff. Councillor Michael Duff. Okay, thank you. Next, we go to Councillor Victor Warrington. One apology, Chair, uh, Councillor Alan Rainey. Thank you, Victor. And next, we go to Councillor Paul Robinson. He's on WebEx. Thank you, Chair. Uh, two apologies, Councillor uh, Stevenson and Councillor Thompson. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Garvin, are you standing in for? So next we go to Councillor Garvin McPhillips, who's standing in for Mary Gardy for the SDLP. Sorry, I have to light you up. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, just uh, apologies for Councillor Gardy, and also I'll have to leave early myself as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, we come to the uh, single member parties and independents. Anybody aware of any apologies from that group? No. So, thank you. Uh, that's the apologies. I've already signed the uh, the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 7th of December. So next we go to declarations of interest. Victor. Right. Councillor Warrington. Yeah, uh, estate matters. Um, one of the properties messaged, uh, I have a brother who's involved in it. So 5.1. Thank you, Victor. And, uh, I'm not seeing anybody indicating on WebEx and there's nobody else in the chamber, so I'll take it that's all the apologies. If you become aware of something, of course, you can obviously update it as the meeting goes on. So next we go to matters arising from the meeting on the 7th of December. So we go to page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page six, uh, I'm assuming that's you, Emmett, uh, I'm going to have to, you're not in the right seat. Is that your light on? Yeah. Thank you. Do, do you know which seat it was in? I can move. I'm happy enough to move. No, I, 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 you, I, I can work. Uh, you're just in Councillor Deacon's seat. So when it comes to the vote, uh, if you move to the seat beside that, but we'll not worry about that if we come That's to the vote. No bother, Chair. No, it's just, um, sorry, my, my online isn't opening at the minute, but um, in relation to page six, just to, again, just to reiterate, I suppose, my dissent in opposition to the resolution and 6.1 in terms of the the agreement with SGN. I think the you know the fact that we've the fact that we originally um had requested that we get some independent um advice on this and we subsequently have taken the the letter of offer from the company itself to me it isn't good enough and I, I appreciate that we've come back with a quote there of uh, fifteen thousand pound, I think it was for um, an independent report, and that again, that's obviously extortionate, and I wouldn't expect um, the council to be footing the bill for for doing so and and for providing that information or providing that detail. But I think it would have made more sense that we actually rejected that application and had the the applicant go through the full planning process, which I think would have given us a bit more time and a bit more. Uh, expertise in terms of uh, allowing that application to be assessed and any associated risks mitigated. So uh, I just want to put again on record my dissent and my opposition to that decision that was taken by Council at the last month's meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. That's noted. So page 7, page 8, page 9, page 10, On page 10, on item 12.1, uh, Director John News 
has uh, some correspondence in reference to that. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, correspondence received from uh, DFI in respect of the two issues that uh, had been raised at the, the last meeting. That was in respect of the clearance of water tables and also uh, the pothole. Uh, uh, repair machinery. Uh, so two uh, two pieces of correspondence. The first is from uh, Mr. Healy, uh, just setting out the department's approach in terms of the clearance of water tables. And then there's also a second piece of correspondence uh, from uh, Mr. McQuillan and DFI uh, roads regarding the pothole machine. That's included at uh, item 9.3.1 uh, within the, the meeting pack. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go to uh... Councillor Robert Irvine in the chamber. Sorry, Chair. Uh, thanks very much. It's about the, the letter with regard to the Inniskillen Town Centre. Can I ask the Director, John? Uh, sorry, that's the next item. Oh, sorry, I thought you'd finished. That's OK. okay. No, My apologies. Uh, I'm going to go to Councillor Bernice Swift on WebEx. I was waiting for her, but she hadn't appeared at that stage. <laughs> Gura Magat, uh, John, thank you very much. And just being persistent about the pothole machine. Uh, John, will I wait until 9.3 to continue speaking about that aspect of the letter, Gura Magat? No, I think I think we're going to if we can wrap it up here now. Uh, we're, we've both part, both uh, we've looked at both pieces of correspondence. So I think if we if we concluded the, all the business around that now at this stage. Right, thank you, John. Right, well, um, as was known uh, in the past, and I suppose the responses that we've had thus far have been uh, less than satisfactory. And as I said, I use the word persistent. And I think for and on behalf of our constituents, we must be persistent where uh, the availability of this machine is. The fact that uh, the letter, I suppose, says that um, the, the availability of capital funding was not an influencing factor. Um, is encouraging from, from my point of view, because uh, budget availability, as we all know, is usually the first reason or the rationale not to delve any further into things that can make a difference. So I'm insisting then for further assessment uh, for the simple reason uh, the pothole problem is increasing and becoming quite the serious problem and frustration for all our citizens and ratepayers. Now, bearing in mind, and I've said it again, this is not our responsibility, it's a central government responsibility, but I'm uh, taking heed of what the roads minister said to us when he said, keep shouting, make your voices heard loudly and clearly. So I'm doing that once again on behalf of our citizens. And the fact that the pothole machine, um, as reported uh, um, way back long before uh, last Christmas, uh, that it has covered 700 potholes in one month by using this four part process in the Republic of Ireland and the UK. I think we definitely need to hear a lot more about it. And I don't accept the letter that we did receive a way back um, with a few bullet points um, where it didn't explain fully and quantify the exact rationale of why the department is not going to help us. So to that end then, John, and I know you've been having very helpful conversations with Mr. McQuillan, and I thank you very much for that. I'm proposing now here tonight that Mr. McQuillan would meet us informally and have uh, an in-depth discussion on the pothole fixing machine uh, once and for all, that, which will enable all councillors uh, to have their input and their questions, queries and challenges on the same. Um, three years again of the continued non-working and stalemate at Stormont uh, is providing serious problems for us uh, all as ratepayers, citizens and indeed councillors. So we're keeping on the persistent path to provide a solution uh, for the state of our roads with this machine. So thank if I can have and please, Chairman, I fully appreciate that. And thank you, John, again. Thank Very you. And, uh, I'm seeing next Councillor John Coyle. I'm hoping you're coming in to second that. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm happy to second Councillor Swift's proposal. Um, I think like everybody, we've been inundated in this past uh, week and a half with potholes on the roads. Um, with the frosty weather, it has just uh, made the uh, main and back roads, uh, you know, treacherous for drivers. And 
a few constituents have damaged vehicles on uh, potholes, so it needs to be sorted and they need to be fixed as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Swift, can I get you to propose noting, and Councillor Coyle, can I get you to propose second the noting of the correspondence? Yes, propose the noting of the correspondence. Thank you. Seconded it. Thank you, John. Uh, next, we're going to, uh, I'm assuming you want to come in on this, Councillor Barton? Right, okay. Um, uh, Mr Chairman, if you could... Uh... Allow me a little bit of latitude in relation to the potholes. Speaking of potholes, there. Can you bring your mic down a wee bit, please? Thank you. Yep. Here, you, you speak of potholes very often. There's a lot of damage done in relation to the frosty weather and snowy weather along the verges of the roadsides. Also, many of them are deeper, deep or deeper than potholes, and also need to be looked at with regard to mending. Thank you. Yes, that that'll be noted on when we're having that informal meeting as well. And next, I'm going to Councillor Warrington. Are you looking to come in on the same topic? The, the next topic. Okay. Thank you. So that's that matter concluded. Is there anybody contrary to the proposal and that's been seconded? I'm not seeing any indication. So we'll take that as a proposal. Next, we go to page eleven. And. Uh, I'm going to go first of all to Director John. But is it, you know, yeah. Um, do I need to turn you on here? Uh, is that the man? No, sorry. Yeah, that's it. Th thank you, Chair. Yes, correspondence, Chair, from uh, the Department for Infrastructure in relation to the establishment or the re-establishment of parking enforcement in in a Skilling Town Centre. Uh, members will be aware of the Environmental Improvement Scheme, and, and uh, because of that, the the parking enforcement was obsolete due to the physical changes, as is outlined in the letter. Um, in order to re-establish them, it requires a legislative process, and uh, as uh, the Department of Infrastructure has informed us now, that process can take between six and nine months to to complete and uh, in that period of time the department can kind of carry out any parking enforcement uh, on the on the main streets in, in Enniskillen. Thank you Chair. Thank you John and first of all I'm going to go to Councillor Robert Irvine in the chamber. Thanks very much. First of all before I go on to that I, I need to declare um, declaration of interest under document 5.2 that's the director's report um, item 3.2.1 I'm a member of Derry Linen District Gun Club and there's a sealing of documents. So that's one declaration of interest. The second thing is in regard to this letter from the Permanent Secretary. Can I ask John why this has only been instigated now? Because we've had the public realm scheme for the last two, two and a half years. The plans are approved and passed. Why wasn't this actually carried out prior to the actual completion? Is there a requirement under legislation that works must be complete before the necessary changes can be instigated through legislation? If not, why has this not been done before? Chair, we'll certainly check out with the Department for Infrastructure in relation to that as to as to why the process only starts now. I suppose there there may be small changes that are made to the to the parking bays and so on as, as the as the scheme progresses, and I would imagine that is the reason why it has to be complete prior to uh, prior to anything being being sealed off in legislation, just to have that defin definitivity. But we'll certainly check with the Department for Infrastructure. That's okay. Thank you very much. Next, I'm going to bring in Councillor Warrington. Thank you, Chair. Well, again, uh, sort of on the back of what Robert's saying, I, I think the fact that they're talking about three or six to nine months before this legislation com comes in is an absolute is an absolute disgrace. Uh, we have the main street area of Inneskillen right from um, East Bridge Street up to Darling Street, and it's basically a free for all. Um, parking bays. Uh, loading bays and my own uh, usual one, uh, disabled bays that nobody, you know, nobody and anybody can use. Uh, nobody can can enforce uh, the regulations on them. Um, and I think seriously, so I would be certainly hoping um, or proposing that we go back and 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 put this forward that we are concerned 
especially as we're approaching Easter and the summer months, uh, that there is going to be this, um, because there's no doubt that the, the Main Street area in, in, in Esquilin has been abused by workers um, parking on the street all day, uh, and therefore uh, the shoppers and the, those wanting to go to businesses can't, uh, can't avail of any of the parking spaces on the Main Street. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Victor. And next we can go to uh, Councillor Keith Allett on, on Webex. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Well, obviously I'd agree with what uh, Councillor Warrington's after saying. I know at the last meeting when this was brought up, uh, the, the, the issue with regard to uh, people parking on the, on the town centre all day parking has uh, probably got worse. So I'd like to propose that maybe the council writes in a skill and bid and ask them to communicate out to the shop owners and that they could communicate to their staff the, the, the disadvantages of them parking all day on the street of Enniskillen and that day they would maybe use the car parks that allow the shoppers a uh, time to come in and park and uh, do their business. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Keith. Next, I'm going to go to Councillor Paul Blake again on Webex. Yeah, happy to support um, Councillor Elliot, what he was saying there. Um, but also I'd like to request from DFI, what exactly do they need to do in terms of remapping Enniskill and Town Centre, which hasn't changed in a long time, except the new changes with the public realm, but something that takes six to nine months. What are they using a ruler for it? It's, it's astonishing because never did I think I'd see the day where I'd be commending the work of the Redcoats, but over the festive period, we could see clearly the need for it. And like what Councillor Elliott said, when when business owners are parking up the town centre, then it's blocking it from shoppers coming in. So I think that some of them really need to have a look at themselves. But if the, if there is a request, could go into DFI and ask what exactly needs to be done that takes six to nine months. It's, it's astonishing. Okay, thank you, Paul. And next we go to Councillor Alex Baird in the chamber. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm sure my Enniskill Town Councillor will forgive me as an Erin West Councillor coming in in this matter, but I do use Enniskill Town Centres, which gives me some reason to speak. No, I, I, going back to Robert's original point about DFI, I thought DFI were an integral part of the planning process and the group that uh, sat for a couple of years while the public REM scheme was being done. And it just beggars belief that the scheme has to be complete before they realise uh, that uh, the old parking uh, regulations were outdated by the change in parking spaces. That was a major topic of discussion during the progress, the reduction of something like 18 parking spaces on the main street as a result of the project. So I just find it so strange that, the, 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 that it, the, uh, they wait to the end of the scheme before they start uh, regularising their legislation. To me, that should have been an integral part of the planning process of the scheme. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alex. And next we go to Councillor Tommy McGuire. Uh, good morning, Mr. Thank you, Chair. And again, just to add my voice of dissatisfaction with the behaviour of some of the people uh, in the town centre that are employed in the town centre and uh, the history of the, the traffic wardens and indeed the red coats was a, a response to requests from businesses in the past to aid the flow of traffic through the town centre. And it's regrettable now that some of the, the, the same people are actually occupying the spaces and disregarding the, the access for the public. And again, if it, just in reflection on the letter, the length of time it's going to take because we, through the work of the public ground scheme, we haven't enhanced the uh, accessibility for the disabled people in parking. And we've multiple multiplied the number of spaces and the access points and it's regrettable that all that is going to be put on hold for so long uh, i don't know is there any action that the council could take in communicating with business people have we any direct line to them uh, apart from through our, our uh, town shaping and committees like that that maybe this item could be added to those agendas to put the message out there that like uh, it is in response to business people that traffic wardens were introduced but yet now they're abusing their they're defeating their own purpose by taking blocking uh, 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 paying customers from parking and having access to their town centre that they so desire. Gormagat, Kerry. Thank you, Tommy. And next we go to Councillor Matthew Bell. Uh, 
Sorry, uh, thank you, Chair. Just going on from what Councillor Warrington said, and I know it's an issue very close to his heart and one he speaks very regularly on, so I'm happy enough to second his proposal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Evan, can I ask that you note the correspondence around this? And uh, who was it come in second? Councillor Warrington, thank you. No, I think, Chair, we, we have everything proposed and seconded. Just in relation to Councillor Maguire's about adding it to the agenda, I, th I think it is, we, we can do that to all the, the town centre forums and the forums with the business leaders and and, and indeed uh, Councillor Elliott's uh, to, to correspond with, with, uh, with Anna Bid. I think we'll, we'll undertake to at every every opportunity to, to, to try and impress the, the, the fact that workers shouldn't be parking on, on the main street in Anna Skillen. Okay, thank you. So uh, that's, that includes the uh, matters arising out of the minutes. And next we go on to item 5.1 and it's Director John News. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is State's Matters uh, paper. So a number of items set, uh, set out in the paper for decision and uh, a number of items for information. If I just cover uh, the items, uh, first of all, for decision in section two. The first is a uh, proposed installation of a, a telecommunications mast at Oma Leisure Centre. Uh, this has previously been considered by members and the background of this is set out within the paper. Uh, at that time in 2019, members had asked for some further clarification about uh, 5G technology and independent uh, information on health and safety implications of the technology. And that's subsequently reported to uh, the Broadband Working Group in March 2021 and then the Regeneration and Community Committee in April 2021. One, and the advice noted that uh, provided overall exposure limits remain below the international guidelines that there were no consequences for public health anticipated uh, and therefore on that basis it's recommended that the council enters into a 10-year lease arrangement in respect of the installation of a telecoms mast in the grounds of Oma Leisure Centre that will be subject to assessment uh, of rental by LPS and compliance with all the not necessary statutory approvals. Uh, so I should say that's a, a an agreement with uh, the provider there is jointly operated by O2 and Vodafone. Uh, the uh, next item then 2.2 is uh, Mullinus Garty Caravan Park, Listen Ski. Uh, again, background to this item uh, set out in the paper, uh, Council had uh, previously disposed of the site uh, comprising uh, six and a half acres by way of a 99 year lease uh, to Mullinus Garty Caravan Park and a nominal rent together with a, a payment of a premium of 85000 uh, the uh, lease contains a restrictive user clause uh, that the premises uh, to only use the premises as a caravan park and the new less lessee has expressed an interest in acquiring the freehold which would mean that the site could then be developed for other other uses subject to planning approval uh, noted that officers have considered this and uh, disposal of the freehold may lead to a potential loss of visitor accommodation and result in negative impact on tourism potential and benefits to the local area and there are uh, noted in the paper limited caravan and camping sites uh, locally in that locality so on that basis it's recommended that the council retains the freehold in accordance with the current leasing arrangements to ensure an alignment with the strategic direction set out in the visitor experience development plan uh, item 2.3 then is, uh, and I've used a shorthand of uh, referring to Gorchin Road, uh, road widening, uh, so was the full title and uh, reference to planning application within that uh, is actually land at Mountjoy Road and Gorchin Road from the junction of Mountjoy Road and the old Mountfield Road leading to uh, Gorchin Road. Uh, but uh, hence uh, just the, the shorthand form that I've used in, in the title there. Uh, essentially, we have had uh, meetings with DFI Roads uh, following the successful planning application uh, that was issued in March 2022. Uh, and DFI have indicated that uh, they would hope to progress the scheme uh, early this uh, this calendar year. And on that basis, uh, they require a land take of 0 0.783 hectares uh, within the, the cartilage of the Grange Park. Uh, the land take uh, has been assessed by Land and Property Service and they have assessed the compensation payable to the Council of 12,500 uh, and has therefore recommended that early entry be uh, permitted uh, to DFA to progress the works and that uh, LPS assessment of the compensation is approved and that would uh, also then uh, be uh, DFA responsible for Council's reasonable legal fees. 
Uh, item 2.4, uh, then there's a, uh, members will recall that in October uh, 2022, uh, they approved uh, a number of applications under the COVID Recovery Small Settlement Regeneration Programme, which is administered by the Council and funded by the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Department for Communities and Department for Infrastructure. Uh, the programme provides success, successful applicants with capital funding to assist in the regeneration and development of villages in ways that support their important social and economic roles. And approval is sought from council to execute appropriate legal agreements uh, which are necessary for both the successful applicants uh, to the, under the program and the statutory bodies that are involved in the funding of those schemes uh, i think there were uh, possibly uh, 15 uh, applicants that were uh, advised to members previously in say, the regeneration and community committee in october 2022 and those papers are available separately on uh, decision time given the full details uh, 2.5 and 2.6 uh, ex approvals sought to uh, proceed to an expression of interest for mobile catering provision at the Grange Park and that's part of the overall Grange Master Plan uh, and uh, certainly with a view to having uh, a catering provider, mobile catering provider uh, appointed uh, before we get into the uh, the summer period and the, the busier time of the year. And then uh, 2.6 uh, to uh, seek expressions of interest for the operation of canteen and catering facilities at OMA Agricultural Mart. Uh, 2.7 then is uh, 2.8 is retrospective approval for the use of council uh, property. Uh, and those are noted at the Eden Street Car Park in Enniskillen during December and uh, activities in Gorton Glen Forest Park uh, by Breeze Barista Bar uh, uh, during the, the lead up to the Christmas period. Uh, finally, then at uh, item three, uh, a number of issues uh, for information. Uh, first of those is uh, a notice of intended entry that's been served in the Council by Northern Ireland Water for uh, sewer, habil sewer habilitation, rehabilitation works uh, along a small section of uh, Wellington Place Car Park in Enniskillen. Uh, and uh, the ceiling of documents is set out uh, within 3.21 through to 3.26. Uh, and I'll, I'll go through those. If, if uh, you require it's uh, a date of arrangement in respect of propo proposed shooting range at uh, Edenmore Road Dune, uh, Derry, between Derry, uh, Derry Lynn uh, and District Gun Club and the Council and Thomas and Thomas and Anna McGoldrick. Uh, then a bid writing framework uh, between the Council and a number of uh, providers uh, as listed within the paper uh, variously. Uh, Capaxo, uh, Kieran Collins, Cogent Management Consulting, Food for Thought Global, LMK, Lorraine McCourt Consulting, McCann Consulting, and Peter Quinn Consultancy Limited. Uh, short form contracts uh, between the Council and a number of contractors that are carrying out works for us, and uh, us McCusker contracts at, uh, at the transfer station and uh, waste transfer station in, in Gord Rush, and then also works at Kelly Fole, and then upgrade works uh, with GR White at Marble Arch Caves. And and also the McCusker contracts in respect of multi-use trails at Ecclesville Forest Park. Uh, so the recommendations set out in uh, 9.1, uh, Council approves uh, the items as listed 9.1 through uh, the 9, uh, 9.17, and at 9.2 that the Council notes uh, 9.28 uh, and 9.29. Thank you, John. And, uh... First of all, indicating we have Councillor Josephine Deacon on WebEx. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, John, for your report, and many thanks uh, to you and your team for all the work uh, that you have put into these important estate uh, matters. Uh, I think you've provided a very comprehensive report, uh, and I want to uh, propose uh, the recommendations, Chair, uh, including the items for noting. Uh, Chair, if I could just make a comment uh, on the, first of all, the proposed telecommunication mast at Oma Leisure Complex. Um, I have looked at the maps uh, provided uh, and I'm confident that this mast will not um, uh, intrude unduly on the uh, uh, facilities at Oma Leisure Complex. I am pleased that we have received assurances regarding the safety uh, and health implications of this mast. Uh, Chair, you will be aware that um, Oma Leisure Centre uh, faces on to uh, significant uh, residential uh, amenities, and it's important that residents who uh, occupy properties there 
are assured of the safety of this mast. So uh, I'm pleased uh, about that. And secondly, then the um, road widening scheme at the Gorchin Road. I think it is so important that this um, project progresses as quickly as possible. And therefore, I am in uh, support of the early entry uh, to the site. Um, of course, I regret the removal of the mature trees on this site, but I am assured that the replanting schedule uh, uh, will be um, uh, a, a very worthwhile uh, replacement for those uh, trees which have been lost. So just with those comments, Chair, I'm happy to propose the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. Next, it's, uh, sorry, Anne-Marie Fitzgerald on WebEx. Yes, um, thanks, John, for letting me in. I just want to second Councillor Deacon's um, proposal there. Um, just concerns just with the mast at Village Centre, but, you know, um, I think that masks are very, well, it's, well, it's not very much needed. Everybody needs the technology, um, students and their phones and people getting their emails and everything from work, and especially when they would exercise and that. So um, I'm happy enough with the position there. It was just the location, just as... Um, Councillor Deacon said there with neighbours are reassured with health. Um, and uh, then the other thing is through with the Grange Park. I know that it's not nice to see mature trees removed, but this is um, a project that has been highlighted for quite a while along the Virgin Road to allow um, better traffic control and free flow of movement of traffic towards that end of the town and especially into the new um, school site. And it's great to see that they will be replaced. I know it's not what we're getting. We're, we're used to the mature trees along that side of the road. But, um, you know, maybe in a couple of years, we might have been losing them anyway because they're getting old and they're getting top heavy and that. So, um, yes, I'd like to welcome all development. And it definitely will have no, um, I know the new play park has been put up in there. A lot of work's been going on there. So um, I know from previous discussions that there's no detriment to anything along that side anyway. So happy enough to propose. Thank you. Thank you. I'm all right. Next we go to Councillor Emmett Michael Ear in the chamber. Thank you, Chair. Um, unlike the, the previous couple of speakers, I have a, a couple of issues with this report. So um, I'll, I'll definitely be dissenting from what's in it, but I'd like to actually make a counter proposal. Um, first off, in relation to the works at the Oma Leisure Complex site, the advice notes that provided the overall exposure remains below international guidelines. No consequences for public health are anticipated. Now, to me, that's that's far from a guarantee. And as Councillor Dehan rightly uh, states, this isn't far from a residential area. So I want the I don't feel secure or safe in signing off on this without assurances that this isn't going to impact on people who are living in the vicinity and indeed the people that use the, the leisure complex itself. So I wouldn't be in favour of supporting that. I also note that the, within the plans attached, the proposed height of the, the mast is 22 and a half metres. It states in the drawings the, the tree level is 16 metres currently. Now I'm aware of the site and I would maybe question that, that that is accurate, but that's that's quite a significant structure to be introduced into the local leisure complex. Uh, as I say, across the road from a number of houses, so I would I wouldn't feel comfortable uh, proceeding with that, and I would like to clarify how we go about getting safety assurances that this isn't going to impact on people who reside in the area. Uh, the second issue, two point three, in relation to the road widening, <coughs> excuse me, proposals at the Gorgian Road. I, I would object to and oppose the, the schedule points noted, including point seven, which is the felling of a mature tree, and point nine, which is the removal of exercise equipment within the, the, the Grange Park. Uh, I would also query when the other removed items, which include an identification plaque, uh, bin, signage, lit stone and bronze sculpture, when will they be returned and uh, where will they be returned? Because it's not confirmed within the report. Uh, and I also note that in Appendix 2, page 5, it makes reference to a hedge that's going to be removed as part of this. Now, I suppose being mindful of our environmental and biodiversity commitments, I would query how some of these proposals sit with them. I appreciate that on page 4 of the report, 4.3, the assets and other implications notes under point 3, that it's assisting community provision. 
uh, and I would agree that widening the footpath is something that, that does do that. But at the same time, we're reducing green space access at Grange Park and we're destroying a, a mature tree at Hedro. So I would just query maybe how that balances out. So again, I'd just make, make that as a, a couple of points. And uh, as I say, if we're proceeding with this, I would dissent just from those two items. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Next, we go to uh, Councillor Matthew Bell in the chamber. Uh, Chair, I actually can't believe what I just heard from the previous speaker. The same councillor last night who went into a rant about other councillors commenting and making proposals in other, uh, in other DAs that they don't represent has just now completely undermined himself and made a various proposals in regard to the OMA DA. I would like to come in strongly behind the other OMA councillors, as Dr. Dean proposed and as councillor uh, Fitzgerald commented on. Um, the, the proposals made for Roma here are, are needed. Um, it says in the report that that uh, 4G signal is going to be decreasing in Roma, and I believe Councillor McAleer has also made comments about the redu a reduction of phone signal and poor phone signal throughout the district. So, again, I just can't believe what I just heard previously. Uh, in regard to the, the Gorchin Road, um, that's going up to the school site. These changes are needed and will be needed um, eventually for the when the Stroud campus opens, and I fully support them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Next, we go to Councillor Diana Armstrong. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, John, for the report. It's just I wanted to come in for a bit of information on item 2.4, the COVID Recovery Small Settlement Regeneration Programme. Um, just some further information on the types of appropriate legal agreements that the Council will seek to um, expedite um, with both successful applicants and statutory bodies. I think these are legal agreements that will be required by the funders uh, as the programme is being executed by the council uh, and then administered uh, with the, the successful applicants. So I think it's, there will be a, a requirement for legal agreements from the, the various funders that I noted there with the applicants and their sales. So that's I that's the type of legal agreement uh, as to the, the specifics of those legal agreements. I would imagine it will be fairly standard across each of the applicants, but it will be specific to each of the, the individual successful applicants within the program okay that's fine that's clear thank you thanks john okay. finally we go to councillor donal coffee on webex yeah thanks chair i just want to before i commence uh reference the fact that i had my hand up the last time when i wanted to express my dissent from a proposal from councillor elliott uh if that could be noted um the the uh in regard to this uh <clears throat> Uh, I would just second uh, the proposal made by Councillor McAleer there. Um, we, we seem to be very casual about uh, removing um, mature trees in general as a society. And I certainly have been uh, contacted by residents in Oma who have uh, highlighted to me uh, concerns over this. Um, that, you know, green space is worthwhile preserving. Uh, and uh, there's nearly always a better way to do things rather than encroaching on the remaining green space in our towns. Um, and I think that we need to reconsider this. So I'm happy to support uh, Councillor McAleer on that in regard to the 5G uh, potential. Sorry, um, sorry, uh, don't I'll correct yeah. you there. It doesn't refer to 5G, it refers to 4G. No, it actually says 5G in the report. You read it, Chair. Um, I'm sorry for cutting across you, but uh, you, you uh, obviously haven't read the report if you said it doesn't reference 5G. 5G is actually referenced as being cap it's capable of accommodating 5G at the future point. And that is quite concerning because as we as a council know, there is a principle known as the precautionary principle. And I know that a lot of councillors would agree with it. I was not at all. Uh, if you remember the report that came back to us on the 5G, there was a lot of criticisms of that report. It seemed to be actually more promotional, a corporate, uh, you know, greenwashing exercises we're used to. And I don't have much confidence really in what I've read around the 5G technology. I know that there's a lot of people who have a lot of concerns around it. And I know that there's also concerns around security uh, on 5G, most notably concerns that companies like Huawei can actually access people's emails and so on through this technology. So again, precautionary principle to me suggests that we should at least consider uh, not proceeding with something that is 5G capable 
I have no issue really with 4G as far as I understand that's that the, the risk from that are much lower but there are I, I do understand concerns around in particular children with 5G and I, I cannot agree with that either. Thank you Chair. I dissent from that as well. Next we go to Councillor Adam Gannon. Thank you Chair. I wasn't initially going to come in but all this talk on on 5G and and kind of going into myths and scaremongering here from some, you know, this isn't a, this isn't a new technology whatsoever. It's been about for decades and it's been used in other fields for, for decades, including radar. And there's been no implications. We got a report. We asked for an independent report. We got it and it gave us, uh, it was a very good report and it gave all the information said that there was no risk. Uh, and, you know, the same counsellors who are trying to, to stop mobile masts being installed will be the very same councillors who I have no doubt in a number of years' time will be complaining when they don't have these services. And as I said, we're getting into kind of, we're heading into conspiracy theory. It's getting a bit tinfoil hat-esque. Uh, so I'll just say that we need to follow the information, the facts there, and it's there. It's been about for years, Chair, and we should be really trying to advance our mobile signal across this district. We have a massive deficit there uh, and I know I'll be doing it in my best to get mobile signal as will other councillors uh, and services for this uh, district and the constituents, Chair. Thank you. Um, so we have a proposal from Councillor Deakin to go with the recommendations and that's seconded by Councillor Amory for shared. And just to clarify, I'm going to go back to Emmett here. You're going to suggest that we go with the minutes with the recommendations apart from one and three. Is that basically what you're? I'm going to bring you in there briefly. Yeah, uh, it's not, yeah. Without without those, and saying we need further reassurance on both. But chair, just in relation to a point of clarification, um, and and perhaps you're in a position to answer this as chair, um. Councillor Bell made a comment there that I'm not permitted to speak in other DEAs, but obviously his party going on last night are permitted to speak in other DEAs. So just maybe like for their clarification on what he means by that. I work full time in OMA and like Councillor O'Coffey, I've been approached directly on this subject. So I'd, I'd just like a wee bit more clarification on what he actually means by making infantile comments like that. Thank you, Chair. I'm not going to bring you in. I understood that he was referenced the fact that you were questioning councillors speaking on stuff in other DEAs. And I think it's we're entitled to speak on anything that's brought before this chamber. As councillors, we are elected to represent all of the people of Fermanagh and Oma District. And that'll be my ruling on it. Okay, so we'll go first of all to the first proposal, and that is from Councillor Deacon and seconded by Councillor Amory Fitzgerald to, uh, okay, we'll get that set up. Can we get that set up, please? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's coming up as your name, sure, in the right seat. Um, have we the vote set up in the chamber? I know it's on WebEx. Yeah, there we have it now.
Have you got the results of the chamber there, Peter? I'm not getting the results for the chamber. Oh, yeah, I'm not. Thank you. Can you take us back a screen, Selena, please? So, uh, that's 29-4, two against, and two not voting. So, uh, that proposal is passed. So, go on now to agenda item. Sorry, do you need to sum up? No. So, next we go on to street naming, which is agenda item 6.2, and we go back to Officer John Boyle. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it's a uh, dual language uh, street naming, probably now a, a standard report on, on, on a monthly basis. Uh, we have 11 road and street names uh, which were brought forward for dual language. Um, and you will note in, in Table 1 of uh, 2.6 um, that uh, six of those 11 have met the criteria uh, and, and five have not. Um, at 2.7, uh, the Irish language officers have uh, uh, looked at the translations of those, um, and these translations have have been sent to the requester. I, I understand there may be an issue with uh, two of those, which are currently under consideration of, of, of the six. But uh, in Table Two, the Irish translation for the official name is is noted. Um, in relation to the financial implications, um, I know. Last month, members had, had requested that we provide an update uh, both on what has been approved uh, by committee and what has actually been expended uh, in, in the financial year. Uh, members will recall that uh, there was a, an initial budget of 200,000 in relation to for dual language. That was revised actually in, in November uh, down to 150,000 uh, for, for the year. And in relation to that, uh, the amounts that have been uh, approved by this committee uh, are in the region of 166,000. Um, now, that isn't expenditure, so it doesn't necessarily relate to the, the capital budget itself. And we would anticipate that we will continue to, to get approvals for those uh, road and streets that uh, we have been asked for. And, and I think I've reported previously that we have over 350 in total that, that we had at the, at the start of this process. In, in terms of actual expenditure for the year, um, the actual expenditure to date of, of those uh, that have been installed amount to um, just over 17,500 and the uh, um, amount of committed expenditure for signs which have been ordered uh, and which most of which will be installed by the year end uh, amounts to 139,000. So the total projected capital spend will be just over the 150,000 but just very slightly over the 150,000 at 157,000. So uh, therefore, Chair, it's recommended that the Council approves the installation of dual language signage for the uh, the streets and the roads listed in Table uh, 2 of the report in accordance with the street road and naming and numbering policy, including dual language. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. And we go, first of all, to Councillor Patrick Withers in the Chamber. Thank you, Margaret Carley. Uh, I want to welcome the report and I'm pleased to see the continued growth of the Irish uh, or the dual language signs throughout the district. I think it's highlighting the demand there is out there. a significant demand um, for greater visibility of the Irish language. Um, however, I also want to take this opportunity to say that's been disappointing and frustrating to see some of the vandalism um, and damage that's been done to some of these signs after they've been installed. And I'm aware that's existing in our own district and elsewhere. Um, such actions are clearly a hate crime. That's what they are, and I'm going to call it as that. And I would urge those that are involved in these activities to stop. It's uh, costly to the ratepayer and for us as a council. Um, but I say also it's a it's an attack on the Irish language. Um, and unfortunately, some in this chamber too, when it's become for discussion, their tone has also been disappointing and the attitude towards the language. 
So it also asks them to be more respectful um, of all cultures and identities and focus on building a shared and inclusive society as we move forward. And saying that, I'm happy to propose the recommendations, except for um, the Cairn Road at Bohor and Cairn. I understand some residents have queried the translation and um, some of the officials in the council might be aware of that as well. So if that one could be deferred, um, I'd be grateful for that. Um, but I'll say happy enough for the rest of the recommendations. Gar Margaret Carley. Okay, next we go to Councillor Donald Coffey on WebEx. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I totally agree with the last speaker saying that this illustrates a huge uh, demand for the language. Actually, I think it's very disappointing, frankly, uh, the level of uh, interest. Like, I, I, I have to question, how is it that we are targeting the areas that's been targeted for this initiative if like the return rates, the one percent on Radigan Road, uh, sorry, that's the wrong one. The the return rates in some of these are really um, low in terms of uh, response rates, and in some we are seeing, uh, uh, for example, I think there's um, four out of forty eight in Moyla Road and thirteen out of one hundred and nine. You know that. Those are really low rates. Uh, is there is there any way in which we can encourage people to actually take a more a positive view towards ling linguistic diversity rather than run it in this sort of way, which is quite divisive, if I have to say it that way. Uh, like there's a lot of not met there, and, and I, I, I'm just concerned about that. Um, thankfully, none are proceeding where there's, uh, you know, where there was significant opposition. So. It hopefully hasn't, you know, undermined perspectives of things. But the Springwell Drive, I don't know what the trans who come up with a cage of Springwell now. Um, there's lots of words for in Irish for Springwells, uh, Twincha, Tubber, and I don't know why um, you wouldn't translate that. Perhaps there's a re reason for it. But if someone could offer me explanation of it. And one other thing I wanted to raise while I'm here, it's not totally related, but it's something that someone has raised to me and I noted it already in my own head. And I'm gonna say it. In Inneskillen, we have uh, signage uh, that is in Irish and English, which is great. Um, but the signage for the workhouse uh, says Chak Odra, which is a direct transliteral uh, transli tra translation, um, but it is a chronic one. Uh, anywhere in Ireland, uh, a workhouse is known as Chak Uh And I don't know why we would use something that is simply wrong uh, as a translation. So I'm wondering if it's possible for the council to review that sign in particular, because I, I think it's it's not good to have such a, a poor translation. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Next, we go to Councillor Paul Robinson on Webex. Thank you, Chair. Our group will be voting against it. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next, we go to Councillor Stephen McCann on WebEx. Okay, Gorham, I've got a Charlie. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, this is a, a welcome report and it does signify the interest that people are having in our Irish language policy and they're, and they're taking part in the process. Uh, just today or in the last day or two in my own area, the signs in the Ross and Green Road were erected and the feedback I received this evening just from two or three people I've met in the road has been very positive and uh, they look well. So uh, I want to thank the officers and, and all involved in the in the rollout of this project. And uh, I'm happy to I'm happy to second the report, uh, Chairman. Thank you. And next we go to Councillor Chris McCaffrey on Webex. Garmogut uh Catterley and yes, uh, welcome to the report and I would uh, support what has been proposed by Councillor Withers there. Um, and just in relation to Councillor O'Coffey's comments uh, around the, the workhouse translation, he is uh, correct in that. That's a direct translation of the, the word workhouse, but it is chalk the mock, which translates as the poor house, or else you sometimes see prison ibra, which is a, a work prison. So those are, are, are better translations or correct translations. So if we, if we do have, you know, very literal translations, that's not how the Irish language is, is carried into English and, and, and that should be correct. So I would support that that was a proposal he made. I would support that we go back and change that name to uh, to Chalk the Mock, uh, the, the 
which translates to poor house. And then just, you know, I would up my satisfaction that uh, this was brought in is being welcomed by and there is clear support yes, for dual language sign. breaking up, Christopher. Sorry, we're losing you. Sorry. Right. Finally, we go to Councillor Victor Warrington in the Chamber. Thank you, Chair. Well, obviously, uh, Councillor Withers uh, mentioned signs that has been has been vandalised, and certainly, uh, and I'm sure I, I I speak for all our party. We condemn any vandalism uh, to any and any signs or any uh, signs belonging to the council. Let's be honest with you: the the defacing of signs is nothing new uh, in 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 Northern Ireland. You only have to look around my own area. Uh, and if you're heading uh, up anywhere towards Rosleigh, you see a lot of them has been defaced with an S being removed uh, and, and, and not that tidy. And obviously I've been up quite a few bit lately up uh, to Acne Galvin to the hospital and you only have to look uh, at Londonderry and you see the London uh, scored out. So it's nothing new in this country, uh, the defacing of signs, but we, we condemn it. Um, also, we will be voting... Uh, we're not going to get into an argument of this tonight, but we believe that the, the system uh, which we agreed is, is unfair, 15% is not democracy. So we will be voting against this tonight. We're not going to get into a debate on it. Thank you. Thank you, Victor Fraud. Uh, next, we go to Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Um, interesting, uh, interesting input from a number of speakers. Just... Um, and I would propose maybe an amendment just to to Councillor Withers' uh, initial proposal, and and hopefully he'll consider it at least. It is an, an a point that Councillor Coffey made in relation to the translation of Springwell, and I would, as someone with a bit of Irish myself, I would have thought that that could be translated a bit more aptly. And um, so, as Councillor Coffey maybe made the the point that maybe there is a a reason why it hasn't been translated from the English. But um, if we don't have access to that tonight, maybe Councillor Withers would consider um, holding fire on it along with uh, Bohor and Kjarn if he has information in relation to that particular road um, just to revisit at a later date so that we do in fact have the, the correct translation going forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thank, thank you Emmett. we we'll go back to Councillor Patrick Withers. You've heard what was mentioned there. Are you happy with that? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, if there's a query on it, then I'm happy for it to be verified and checked and come back to us in the future. Kermagat. Thank you. And finally, we go to Councillor Adam Gallon in the Chamber. Thank you, uh, Chair. Firstly, uh, obviously, to condemn any vandalism of, of any signs is totally pointless and uh, destructive behaviour that's not welcome. Um, I just have to note Councillor Warrington's comment on 15% on not being democracy. I don't understand why councillors don't get this. Irish is a minority language. Do they not understand what minority means? It does not mean 50% plus one. And we as public representatives have a responsibility to protect minority languages and protect minorities, no matter who they are, no matter what they are, and encourage them uh, and encourage them to, sh to share their culture. You know, we're past the points of majority rules so here. Adam, so I'm I'll just leave it at that, Chair. Exactly, because I was going to stop you there because we've had this debate now every month for the last few months is getting quite repetitive. Uh, so the first proposal is that by Councillor Withers, seconded by Councillor McCann, and amended to exclude uh, Springwell Drive and Cairn Road. And I'm not going to attempt to do the Minaris. So, so those are going to be brought back again. So that's the proposal. There is dissent, so we're going to have a vote on that, please.
¿Dónde está? Okay, so that's 22 for 10 against, so the proposal's carried. We have a second proposal from uh, Councillor O'Coffey, seconded by Councillor McCaffrey, that uh, we review the, the wording at the workhouse. Is there anybody opposed to that being carried out? No, so that proposal's carried as well. So thank you. So we can now move on, and it's uh, street naming and numbering. And again, we're going to Officer John Boyle. Sorry, John, here, turn you on. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, there are two uh, developments for uh, street naming. Um, one is at Gardrum, Drum Connus in uh, Drumore, um, where an application was received on, on, on the 25th of May. The developer proposed a, a number of uh, names, Drum Connus Court, Drum Connus Glen, Drum Connus Meadow. Uh, the development is in the townland of of uh, Drumconnus, um, and therefore it is in line with council policy to use the the, the townland uh, name. From the site layout itself, the the, the word court in in looking at the, at the plans for the development is is a suitable uh, uh, description of of the development itself, and therefore it's proposed that the committee approve the name Drumconnus Court for for the development. The second one is in relation to a development at Drumlahi in in Florence Court, and uh, the developer has proposed uh, Drumlahi Court, and again the term uh, Drumlahi uh, comes from from the town land in, in Florence Court um, and uh, the suggested name does meet the criteria of our, our council policy uh, for Drumlahi Court. Uh, so therefore, Chair, it's proposed that uh, the council approves the name Drumconnus Court um, uh, for the development and also the name Drumlahi Court for the development in, in Florence Court. Thank you. And first of all, we go to Councillor Alex Baird in the Chamber. Yeah, thank you, Chair. As Councillor for Erin West and Drumlahi Court uh, uh, falls within the territorial jurisdiction thereof, I'm more than happy to uh, propose that Drumlahi Court is adopted as the name for the housing. Um, I did a bit of research and I'm told that Drumlahi means ridge of the mud. Now, having said that, listening to previous discussions tonight, there seems to be quite a few erudite Gilgores here who may disagree with that. I do not know, but as I say, I wouldn't want to embarrass the person who uh, provided the translation for me, but uh, they're, they're a well-known person in this chamber. <laughs> um, so, uh, as I say, uh, the only other thing I would mention is the map is not, not quite correct uh, in the context of it. Uh, the map doesn't show the realignment of Drumlahi Cross, which flies in the face of the comment that the townland name is not commonly used within the area. It is, and I've consulted locally, Drumlahi would be the, the colloquial term for the area, and Drumlahi Cross would be what it's known in the Florence Court area. So having said that, more than happy to propose that. And unless there's dissent on the other one, and I hope I'm not stepping on anyone's territorial toes, I'm more than happy to uh, propose the adoption of the totality of the matter. Thank you, Alex. And next we go to Councillor uh, Anne-Marie Donnelly, your first on WebEx. Thank you, Chair. Uh, representing the Tomori area, I'm also very happy to second the recommendation. So between our, myself and Alex, happy to go ahead with proposing the second of that. Thank you. Thank you. And next we go to uh, Councillor Josephine Deacon on WebEx. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, John, uh, for your report and your team for their work. Uh, I want to support the recommendation, uh, Chair, and if I may, make a comment on the uh, Drumconnus Court. 
uh, Drumconnus, uh, if I am not mistaken, is one of the smallest, if not the smallest, townlands uh, in Dromore. Um, I had the privilege of being reared in the townland of Drumconnus. The townland stretches from the Dromore Omer Road over the hill onto the Dromore Fintoner Road. Um, and uh, it certainly has many noteworthy uh, characteristics, but I am very pleased to see that the townland of Drumconnus is going to be incorporated uh, into this development. So thank you for that, Chair, and happy to support the recommendation. Okay, thank you. I have nobody else. I did have, no, you've taken your hand down, Anthony. Thank you. So uh, you've heard the proposal and seconded to adopt the uh, the recommendations for the naming of Drum Connors Court and Drum Lackey Court. Anybody contrary to that? No, so that proposal's passed. Okay, next we go on to item uh, 6.3, and that's the fixed penalty notices. And again, we we'll go back to Officer John Boyle. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, th this provision of information uh, in relation to the potential for implementing a sliding scale for uh, fixed penalty notices for littering and dog fowl, and this was raised at the November uh, Environmental uh, Services Committee meeting. Uh, in relation to the guidance, um, and I must advise members that the guidance changed just in, in December, uh, a change which we weren't aware of until very late on in, in, in December. Uh, the letter offences, uh, uh, we the staff work under the letter Northern Ireland Order uh, 1994, and, and that legislation enables the district councils to issue fixed penalty notices, and it, it it allows councils to specify the amount of that fixed penalty notice, uh, but the legislative default is seventy five pounds. Um, in relation to the two thousand and twelve regulations, it sets. The, the level of fixed penalty notices for litter and for uh, dog fouling at somewhere between 50 and 80 pounds with the default of 75 pounds and it also specifies that the minimum amount that could be charged for discount uh, if for early payment uh, is 40 is 40 pounds the 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 council uh, have adopted the a policy in in 2019 and it was agreed that uh, the fixed penalty notice would be £75 for littering and £80 for dog fouling with a discounted uh, fee or, or a discounted amount of £50 if paid within 10 working days. In December, as I stay in, uh, in December of, of 22, just last month, um, there was new regulations which came into being on the 30th of December 2022, where the, the limits for fixed penalty notices for littering was actually extended from 50 to 80 up to 50 to 200, which allows councils to actually increase their, fi their fixed penalty fine from uh, the 80 pound level up to 200 pound. And I know a number of councils are actually act actively uh, considering that at this point in time. And we would anticipate that we will consider the impact of that and we will bring a report back to members uh, in relation to the level of uh, fixed penalty notice. Getting on to the, the, the sliding scale, uh, which was raised at the November committee meeting, um, officers have carried out research into the sliding scale uh, and how it would operate and, and so on. Uh, we actually have found nowhere in Europe where there is a sliding scale for fixed penalty notices for littering or dog fouling. There is a system in Finland and Switzerland in relation to speeding offences where uh, they use a DFN system for speeding offences, which is very much linked to the salary and is calculated on the basis of an offender's daily disposable income, which normally is, is uh, their salary divided by two. And the more uh, an individual is over the speeding limit, the more DFNs, which is imposed by the courts in relation to that. The UK did introduce uh, similar speeding penalties in 2017, where drivers can be fined up to 175% of their weekly income. But there is nowhere in Europe that we could see where there were where uh, was a sliding scale introduced in relation to littering or, or dog fouling. 
if we were to introduce such a system, then it would require substantial human resources to verify the income and so on in relation to uh, an individual. Uh, I have given information there in, in Table 1 at 2.2.3 of the report that if we were to introduce a sliding scale, what it possibly could look like. Um, but just on the, on the presumption that just remember that the minimum fine fixed penalty notice which we can uh, introduce is £50. So that's as low as we can go in, in the first instance. Um, in order to assess the income of a person, and we do this in, in relation to the affordable warm scheme when, when those applications comes in, there is a very much an extensive amount of work that is involved in verifying income to find to get the evidence of the earnings, whether they're employed, whether they're self-employed, whether in, in receipt of benefits, uh, whether they're in receipt of, of any other income, uh, whether it be from from uh, child mining or, or, or any other benefits or indeed an investment income, um, which is very much, uh, well, one, it's intrusive on, on the individual themselves, uh, but also is very, very time consuming. Um, and we we would say that in order to do that, we it would uh, require an additional resource uh, in in the section, um, and and then when you look at the cost of that compared to the benefit of collecting the fixed penalty notice, it actually would not be worth the council's while in collecting the fixed penalty notice at all because we would not uh, we would not anywhere near recover the the, the full cost of that. Um, in section three of the report, we have estimated that uh, implementing a, an appropriate sliding scale would take six hours for each fixed penalty notice, which would total on average somewhere in the region of £180 per fixed penalty notice. And just remember that our current fixed penalty notice at this point in time is £75 for littering and £80 for, for dog filing. Um, so therefore, Chair, it is uh, recommended that the Council approves the retention of the current regime for the, for the single fixed penalty fine for littering and dog fouling uh, and the relevant discounted amount for early payment. And also notes that the further report will be presented at a future Environmental Services Committee meeting following the review of the Clean Neighbourhoods Policy, taking account of the very recent regulations which were imposed in December 2022. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. Very extensive report. Uh, first of all, I'll bring in Councillor Donald O'Coffey on WebEx. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, this is a rep uh, very interesting report, actually. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily a thing we should put us off that, you know, we're doing something or we're proposing to do something that others aren't doing. I think there's definitely a developing mood that this is the way forward. Having said that, looking at these figures, it is undeniable that it's uh, beyond us at this stage, especially if it takes six hours to uh, process a penalty notice uh, for each one on average, which would be quite uh, horrendous, it seems. So uh, I'm content to uh, vote to note this. Um, I think it is something that we would, I would like to see extended across the board in many ways, but uh, we there would need to be a system put in place probably across at least Northern Ireland to really take it forward. I think it will come, but it's possibly, it certainly seems to be beyond this, this stage. So thanks, Chair. Thank you, Donald. Next, we go to Councillor Adam Gallant. Thank you, Member. Chair. Um, firstly, really appreciate the work that the, the officers and all the staff have done. It's, it's a very uh, detailed report, and there was obviously good work done. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, it's clear, uh, whilst, you know, in principle, I, I, I would be really supportive of uh, sliding uh, scale for fines as has been done in, in certain other circumstances. It's it's just clear from the numbers that it isn't practical here. It isn't economical or cost efficient. It's it's clear that it's a, a size of the fine issue. If it's such a small fine, then it's very difficult. Well, comparatively small uh, to other fines, it's it's difficult to implement in a way that is cost effective. Um, it was inter It was very interesting to read, including what about where we'd be going with legal implications of it. But anyhow, anyway, Chair, I'll, I'll propose the recommendations in, in the report if, if Councillor Rakoffi hasn't already proposed them there. I don't think he did. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks again to, to the officers. and It's not feasible with this, clearly. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we bring in uh, Councillor Robert Irvin in the Chamber. I echo the comments of the previous two councillors. Um, thanks very much for the detailed report, John. Um, and I'm supportive of the recommendations. Thank you. 
Okay, so you've heard it uh, proposed to accept the officer's recommendations by Councillor Coffey, seconded by Councillor Gannon. Is there anybody contrary to that? No, so those proposals are adopted. Next, we go on to agenda item 7.1, and it's a report from the officer, uh, John News. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a report in the Northern Ireland Local Authority Collected Municipal Waste Management Statistics for the year 2021-2022. Uh, as noted in the, the report, this, these are the, uh, the, the final verified or validated figures that were uh, previously provisional figures from the uh, Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. And the, uh, the final quarter of 2021-22 was only uh, validated in November and published uh, in December uh, 2022. So hence, uh, it may seem like a lag in terms of this report uh, coming to members and uh, coming here tonight for information. Uh, but just there is a process to be gone through in terms of validation of all of the statistics. Uh, there is generally very little uh, shift in the st statistics uh, from the, the provisional figures to the final uh, published. But nonetheless, they have to go through that process. Uh, the paper sets out a uh, number of key issues in terms of uh, the total uh, waste tonnage uh, arising and total waste tonnage collected in the, the year 2021-2022. We've noted there that uh, within Fermanagh Noma District Council area, we collected uh, just over 58,200 uh, tonnes, uh, 58,211 tonnes uh, to be precise, and that was a, a marginal increase on the tonnage that had been collected uh, in the preceding year 2020-2021. Which had been uh, was the highest year uh, up to that point, and that was largely reflective of uh, COVID lockdowns uh, during that particular period of time. Uh, noted in the report uh, that the tonnage in collected within the district uh, represents 5.6% of the, the Northern Ireland total uh, tonnage collected, and that would be uh, very much broadly in line with the uh, population distribution uh, within Northern Ireland. Uh, also noted there that 45.8% uh, of waste collected was sent for reuse, dry recycling and composting, uh, and 13.4% uh, uh, was uh, sent for energy recovery, and 38.6% uh, was sent uh, to landfill. Uh, you'll note that uh, there was an increase on the percentage at 2.3, noting that there's been an increase in the percentage of uh, waste that was collected for reuse, dry recycling, and, and composting uh, on the, the previous year figures, uh, which is uh, welcome. And uh, within those figures, when, when you drill down, and there's links provided in the appendices to the, the detailed report. And uh, when we drill down into the detail of those figures around uh, dry recycling, uh, this district actually performs extremely well when it comes to uh, the, the recycling of plastic bottles and also uh, fibrous uh, materials such as paper and cardboard and would be one of the highest performing councils uh, in, in Northern Ireland in that regard. That said, there is uh, definitely scope for further improvement in terms of our recycling. As we noted there, we are uh, below the Northern Ireland average, uh, and that's an area that will remain a, a, a continued focus uh, for us within the, within the directorate and within the council. Uh, we've also noted that uh, the uh, the tonnage uh, was one, uh, per household was one point uh, two six, and that was the it's uh, the, the second lowest uh, tonnage uh, uh, per household per capita uh, within Northern Ireland, uh, just second only behind uh, uh, Belfast, uh, and uh, well below the uh, the Northern Ireland uh, average in that regard. So it does suggest that there is a level of uh, uh, understanding of the importance of, of uh, recycling and, um, and particularly so was, uh, reducing the amount of consumption uh, within the district. Uh, but as I say again, uh, still uh, room for improvement uh, within the figures. Uh, these are presented for, uh, for information. Uh, uh, happy to take any queries that members might have on the detail of uh, Appendix 1 uh, and other than that, the recommendation set out uh, that uh, the paper is uh, noted uh, by members tonight. Thank you, John. First of all, we'll go to Councillor Robert Irvine in the Chamber. Thank you very much, Chair. First of all, uh, I'd like to propose the noting uh, of the report. Thanks very much, John. The, the detail is very comprehensive. Um, a few comments. One, you can notice it. this actually represents 24% of our total council expenditure. That's a huge amount, and I know that has gone up. Um, due to the, the worldwide effect with regard to recycling and just transportation and everything like that. And whilst um, our efforts in sort of recycling, um, 
dry recycling are good. Um, we still could do better. So I think we need to target people. And the message that we should send out to our constituents is if they threw less out of their cars and went more to the centres around the place or even took home, this expenditure by the council could be brought down and we could reuse the resources elsewhere. So essentially, when somebody says, what does the council do apart from collect the rubbish? Yes, we collect the rubbish that you as our constituents produce, but there's a lot that you could do actually to help us so we could better use uh, the rates, income that we have for uh, more schemes throughout the, um, the district. So thanks very much indeed for that. Thank you, Robert. Next, uh, we'll go to Councillor Emmett McAleer in the Chamber. Thanks, Chair, yeah, and thanks to John and the team. I know it's uh, it's always a very interesting report, this one. Um, there's a couple of, I suppose, the stats that, that jump out to me that, again, this council area, 45.8% of waste collected uh, for recycling uh, below the average rate across the district or across the north of 49.7. And that this council ranked 10th overall ahead of only Belfast City Council. <clears throat> that 38.6 of waste was sent for landfill, again above the average total uh, by quite a quite a bit at 24.9%. Um, I know it's a recurring thing and I think it is something that's ongoing. When I look at the stats for Mid Ulster, they seem to be um, superior to yours. I'm wondering what uh, consultation, what conversations are being had in terms of improving our performance and I know that's something that we're all committed to do and all keen to do. And I have another question just in relation to the way tonnage is calculated. And I'm presuming on page three of the, the statistics report, there's a, a note superscript there, number four at the bottom of page three, which says that uh, there's a there's a definition or a, a, a recording there of unclassified tonnage um, which can be attributed to moisture and or gaseous loss during waste transit. So I'm just querying in terms of the tonnage reports or the tonnage figures that we're seeing within these reports, I'm presuming they are actually the curbside collection tonnage as opposed to necessarily the actual recyclable weight of waste that is going to recycling plants. So the, what I'm saying there is there could be non-recyclable waste accounting for some of the, the weight or some of the tonnage for recyclable waste in the in the graph or in the, the measurements presented. And obviously that's something that we need to work towards helping educate um, not only people across the district, but maybe just to be aware of whenever we are looking at the figures in the report. Thank you. Do you want to come in there, John? Uh, th thank you, uh, Chair. And this was just in, in respect of the, the, the comment. We have an ongoing engagement uh, through the Council Waste Forum with uh, colleagues across all 10 uh, district councils, we, uh, particularly work uh, with Mid Ulster uh, colleagues in Mid Ulster District Council. And obviously, the, uh, this council has a, a joint committee in terms of Tully Var. Uh, and, and that's actually that's a great source of learning for us as we prepare for the closure of our own uh, landfill at, uh, at Drummy over the course of the next couple of years. And so, as I think, and I have commented before, the the uh, the, the landfill at Drummy is is a big contributor to the amount that we landfill. Uh, otherwise, that waste would be getting well. Certainly, as things stand at the minute, in terms of you know commercial waste processors and what have you, that would be you know that would have to be transported somewhere else. So at the minute, it's going into landfill, and that that all feeds into our, our closure plans for for Drummy. Uh, and we'd expect to see those figures. They will decrease uh, significantly once that landfill closes in uh, 2024. As to the I suppose the the particular. The query about the the tonnages and the validation. I was just, I'm I'm just not seeing the exact fruit note myself, but I'm I'm picking up the the point that you're making about the, uh, so uh, liquid and sort of gaseous uh, dis discharges. I suppose that wouldn't impact on the the tonnage for dry recycling. Uh, obviously, where it may have an impact would be on the tonnages associated with, uh, uh food waste. You're right. I mean, the, the there's a you know. A, 
a very precise system in terms of the measurement of the tonnages. So there's the, the tonnage that's collected uh, at curbside. The the vehicles come in through uh, waybridges uh, into both of the the, the depots, the transfer, uh, the waste transfer sheds, uh, and obviously so the tonnage in is 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 weighed. Uh, there's that's then also validated in terms of the tonnage going out, and that can uh, contribute to some of the discrepancies. I'd say the 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 way bridges at uh, the depots are extremely accurate and a uh, very complex sales system within that. Uh, and that's why you, say you do see some variation in the, the final reported tonnages, but it tends to be it's you know less than one percentage point, I think, if, if memory serves. I'd need to find the, this precise thing. But there is a very precise uh, uh, and uh, thorough process for reporting the tonnages uh, in and the tonnages out. Uh, so you're right, it is, it's a curbside collection, but then the overall tonnage includes uh, uh, other uh, materials that are brought into HRCs as well. So that's, again, there's, there's a waybridge system for that uh, coming in for the HRCs. Okay, Emmett, are you seconding the noting of the report? Thank you. Uh, next, go to Councillor Donald Coffey on Webex. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks for the report. It's always interesting, as Councillor Blair said, this is a report which uh, endlessly fascinating. I think the one thing uh, <clears throat> I always go back to it. But the one thing I think uh, residents expect the council to do well is is around the uh, the collection of waste and the processing of waste and so on. And I, I think it's important that we do take. Uh, care to ensure that uh, we're achieving our objectives. This report is a mixed bag. Obviously, there's some positives in it. Um, there is overall, uh, I think the, the actually the usually I find better in the the appendix, but the summary is excellent. Uh, the key issues graph indicates that there's been a an increased trend, and it's it's fairly consistent, although there's a bit of to and fro and around it of eight percent over up eight percent over the last say five years. Um, in to total waste arising. I'm wondering, is there any estimation of how this may be affected by the policies that we've put into place around, you know, restricting overtime and not filling vacancies so that uh, there's a potential for brown bins not to be collected and so on? Uh, is this likely to have, is there any estimations on how this is likely to increase waste arising uh, in future uh, in the next year or so as compared to what we have already? The second question really is around, um, it's more of a question around the, I think there's a, a point here made that household waste arising as a percentage of overall waste uh, decreased in Fermanagh and Oma, which is strange, which means we've, we're actually taking in more waste in the uh, recycling centers, I take it. Is that what that is? Um, and we seem to have lower percentages collected through uh, the LAC or LAC, where the lower percentage of household LAC in general, which uh, is that reflective of the infrastructure that we have in place at present? Uh, does that lead to a higher proportion coming in than other areas, or is it a rural thing, or is it is there something that I'm not understanding about that? Um, but those are my two questions. Thanks, Chair. Go ahead, please, John. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to the member for the questions. Uh, I suppose just start with the 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 opening observation about the uh, the increase in uh, total uh, waste arising, the total tonnage collected over the last uh, seven years, where it, it has in or the last six years, where there has been an increase, and I think and that speaks to the I suppose part of the problem uh, that we're trying to tackle, which is around uh, a reduction in consumption. So uh, in terms of that hierarchy, that's that is an issue for us as to how we. Uh, uh, move towards a more circular uh, economy. Uh, as the, I suppose the, the 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 next question then was around the impact of uh, uh, I suppose some of the the controls that we have in place at the minute around overtime and and, and vacancy management. Uh, the, those uh, controls uh, were introduced in uh, quarter three of the current financial year, so they won't have had any impact on the the previous year. Uh, the I suppose. 
the members referred to some uh, uh, missed collections, and I know that's something that uh, a number of members have have raised uh, previously in meetings as well. Uh, missed collections uh, are collected; uh, they are collected at a, at a later time, uh, so we wouldn't expect to see uh, a huge uh, impact. Uh, although the, the impact is, it will it will only be evident in twelve months' time when we get the the year end report uh, for 2022-2023. But we are still collecting those bins, and I say the guidance uh, remains in to the residents that if the, the, we do have a network of uh, an extensive network of household recycling centres across uh, the district, uh, the sorry, could I could I get the second question just because I I, I think there was a reference to the the tonnages uh, the percentage of tonnages that were being collected in household recycling centres compared to curbside uh, collections and uh, the certainly th there is a significant uh, tonnage of uh, of waste that comes in through our household recycling centres uh, and I think and that is reflective of the extent of the infrastructure that we have in in, in place at the minute uh, but as what I think reported previously uh, the members it was at the last meeting the table which uh, demonstrated that it was uh, almost fifty five percent of the total tonnage that comes in through our HRCs comes in through uh, the two main uh, household recycling centres at uh, Gort Rush and, and Drumee. Uh, and then obviously there's, a, there's a, a sliding scale of the percentages that come in from uh, other household recycling centres across the district uh, with those that uh, are closer to uh, so the larger uh, population centres uh, across the district uh, having higher tonnages. Yeah. Thank you, John. So we've heard the proposal to note, and that's been seconded. Anybody contrary to that? No. So thank you. We'll move on now to agenda item uh, seven point two, which is the director's report, and we can go again to John News. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, two items for information on this. First is. Uh, an update on uh, committee actions for the period September to December 2022. Uh, as noted in 2.1.1, uh, during the course of that, uh, those four months, there were 85 actions uh, arising uh, from uh, committee meetings. 80% uh, of those have been completed at this point in time, and the other 20% are in progress. And an overview of those uh, 17 outstanding or in progress actions, rather, are summarised in 2.1.2. Those relate variously. Uh, to a number of uh, actions around the transfer proposed and previous transfer of functions from central government uh, to local government and specifically around uh, articles four and five of waste and contaminated lands legislation uh, the uh, overwhelming uh, majority of the of the in-progress actions relate to uh, various legal and conveyancing processes uh, such as uh, update and management agreements way leaves easements and and licenses uh, and they just they take time to work through with the, the various uh, legal representatives for the council and the, the other parties that are involved uh, a number of actions are around engagement with uh, community and voluntary groups uh, uh, including uh, engagement with locker and uh, landscape partnership and also uh, 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 representations with Into the West uh, Railway Group, and then finally uh, one action that uh, we're waiting to confirm a date, which is a member visit to Enniskillen uh, Workhouse. Uh, so that's uh, for information. Uh, then moving on to 2.2, uh, members had previously asked for a report on composting within the district, and this was this uh, harks back to the, the previous paper in, in some respects as well. So an overview of the, the, the work that uh, Council officers undertake in respect of composting and the services that are offered uh, by council uh, to members. Uh, start there with a, a, just a piece around a, a previous uh, consultation uh, that members will recall in terms of uh, uh, composting processors and, and uh, producers. Uh, and the, I think the question had been asked in a previous meeting as to, you know, would it be uh, more effective for council to do that itself uh, or to explore the, the potential for uh, undertaking composting operations ourselves? But as uh, we've noted within the paper, uh, we collect uh, somewhere in the region about uh, 15,000 uh, tonnes of, of compostable materials. And, and from a, in terms of commercial viability, uh, it's now estimated that, uh, you know, it would be between 70 and 150,000 tonnes is what 
what uh, would be required. So just in, in terms of this point in time, certainly the, the viability of council undertaking that itself uh, wouldn't be uh, something that we would be uh, currently exploring or actively exploring at this point. And we uh, have a number of contracts that are in place uh, with Granville Eco Park and uh, Natural World Products uh, for the, the processing and treatment of uh, both separately collected food waste uh, for anaerobic digestion and also uh, commingled brown bins. And then also, uh, so it's finally just noted uh, some of the work that we've been doing with residents uh, over the last number of years in terms of encouraging uh, increased use of uh, home composting bins and noted there that uh, over the last seven years, uh, that there have been uh, over uh, 1,250 uh, home composting bins distributed uh, across the district. Uh, and uh, so we continue to uh, promote public awareness uh, of the benefits of those and, and support that. Uh, and so we do, however, recognise that compost, the home compost bins are, are quite large, at 330 litres, uh, so 50% bigger than the standard uh, wheelie bins that people have, so not necessarily practical for uh, every single uh, household. So said uh, present the recommendations in the paper then said the council notes the update in respect to the actions for the period september to december 2022 and the update on composting activities so uh first of all i'm saying uh councillor don't know a coffee on webex yeah thanks chair i'd just like to propose to note uh this to start off with uh, the issue i wanted to come in on was uh 2.2.5 which is the home composting bins um, I am quite a fan of these. I have two uh, myself over the years I've acquired and they're always nearly full um, and they produce a considerable amount of compost, which is useful. And uh, I think I, I don't know how much they take out of uh, my family's or household's waste per year, but it is not insignificant by any means. And um, I would imagine the return to us as a council uh, from the uptake of these is quite substantial if uh, people compost regularly and so on and maintain it and all that. And it is a clear, it, there's no real risks with it. It's not a problem. Two things really. One is uh, the, the officers referenced um, promotional activities. I don't think we do promote these enough. And I actually think that if people were aware that there's a free uh, service here uh, and of the benefits and how easy it is to compost, I, I suspect people would actually do it a lot more and there would be more uptake and it would make quite a dramatic impact i suspect on household waste if there was even uh say another thousand of these taken you can imagine 330 liters worth of waste uh, uh going through a system maybe two or three times a year so uh, you know it's not that impossible to do um the other thing is um i know in from a family member in london uh, they ordered a compost system from their local council and in on the council website, there was both a 330 and a 220 for memory uh, litre, which is more appropriate to maybe, you know, some people who wouldn't want the, the bigger one. So I'm wondering, is, is it possible to have a smaller unit? Because I, I think uh, they work equally well. Uh, obviously, they, sorry, they don't. They work better if you have a big one, but they work well enough. Uh, the small ones, they still do the job. It just takes slightly longer and you have to turn things a bit more. But I'm, I, I think that this is something, it's a bit of an easy win for us. The cost of these cannot be very significant. Uh, the level of environmental awareness and interest, I suspect, is dramatically more than it has been years ago, seven years ago, certainly. And, and also the potential maybe to diversify. So we have a number of these. Indeed, I think in London, the, the council offers different colors of home composters. So. I, is it something we can consider and per, uh, pursue? I'd just like to propose that we uh, look at those opportunities and perhaps others I haven't considered. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Donald. And next we go to Councillor Robert Irvine in the Chamber. Thanks very much, Chair. I'm happy to second the proposals, really, that um, we're coming forward with regard to the recommendations. I'll also I'll second Councillor Coffey's uh, proposals in regard to looking into other various means. I just make a comment, I think, on Councillor O'Coffey's effect that his household produces so much rubbish, uh, you know, through composting. I'm sure if we did an analysis of the various members of the household that maybe Councillor O'Coffey produces the most rubbish rather than the rest of his family. Thank you very much indeed. Outrageous suggestion. <laughs> okay, so we, you've heard the, the 
proposal to adopt the, the it's just a note, isn't it? Yeah, note. So it's anybody contrary to that? No. Okay, so next we move on to agenda item 8.1, building control and licensing report, and that's Officer John Boyle. Sorry, turn you on. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yes, Chair, standard report uh, for building control and licensing for the period 16th of November 22 to the 14th of December 22. Uh, Chair, can I just draw attention to members to Appendix 2, uh, the very last uh, page of Appendix 2, Section 4. It was mentioned by members last month uh, for details um, on a regular basis in relation to the number of dogs that were euthanized and uh, the number of dogs which were rehomed. You will see from the table um, that uh, the stray dogs collected and humanely destroyed was one. And as I explained last month, we really do not rehome ourselves, but we send them to animal shelters to for rehoming, and and that number is fourteen, and and those figures will be included in in reports uh, in, here from here on in. Um, the second element of the report chair is in re just in relation for information for the fire safety conference twenty twenty three. There is a there is a. a Flyer uh, included in the in uh, the pack, um, and if as uh, of members wish to attend uh, the annual fire safety conference, uh, nominations would be welcome. Thank you, Chair. So, Councillor Armstrong in the chamber. Chair, and thank you, John, for the report. Um, I'd like to propose uh, the uh, noting the report. And could I propose uh, Councillor uh, Robert Irvine to attend the Fire Safety Conference? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Uh, Councillor Bell. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I'll quite happily second both suggestions there by Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other proposals for people who want to go or I'm sure the officer will take proposals at a later stage if uh, if nobody can make their mind up tonight. Okay, so proposal is to note and that Councillor Irvine wishes to attend, is not we're noting, yeah. So uh Councillor McAleer. Thanks, Chair. Now it's just um I suppose a point of clarification because there seems to be a number of different um options in terms of the, the conference fee. So I'm just wondering which one are we? Are we going for there? Because, as has been repeatedly stated, um, money's tight. So I'm just wondering which of the options are are being explored in terms of the attendees. Well, thank you. I'll bring Councillor Irvine in for that. Uh, just for clarification, it's the two day rates. It's not overnight. It's the day, just attending per day. I think there's an option there for two day non residential delegate. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Irvine. That's very clear. So anybody contrary to that, the proposals? Not seeing anybody. So uh, that's that matter concluded. Next, we go on to item nine on the agenda, which is correspondence. And the first one is the is the car park at Drumra, and we'll go to Officer John Boyle. I'm sure some people will be disappointed by this one. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yes, it's correspondence uh, from Department for Infrastructure in, in relation to the car park at, at Drumra. Members will remember we had a discussion on this um, uh, uh, in June, I think it was, at, at Environmental Services. Um, and in relation to the car park uh, where people were paying fixed and, and were receiving fixed penalty notices uh, for parking and there was a bit of confusion as to what was the car park and what was the free car park and, and so on and at that stage we we saw, saw clarification on the number of fixed penalty notices that have been issued since the introduction of down street parking and also requested that anyone who had been unsuccessful in their appeal that the, those be overturned uh, you will note from uh, the correspondence from the Department for Infrastructure on the number. Um, they have given the figures since the beginning of 2022 until it was suspended in May 22, a, a total of 234,000. Uh, but you will see at the bottom of page one in the final paragraph um, that uh, whilst they have considered it, uh, the Department of Infrastructure uh, have uh, stated that they're unable to cancel the fixed penalty uh, notices which were issued at that time. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, I'm looking, I see uh, Councillor Stephen Donnelly on Webex. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, as said, I mean, it is a disappointing response. And in some ways, I think that it is contradictory in that it acknowledges how uh, they, they understand how the mistake could be made by people who were uh, yeah, using the service, but um, it doesn't seem to have inf informed their approach or their response at all. So disappointing altogether, but I'm happy enough to propose just noting. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, do we have a seconder for that? Uh, Councillor Robert Irving. Okay, so that's that noted. We'll move on. Next one is uh, 9.2, and that's the A5 Curl Road. And we'll go to Officer John Nees. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the Policy and Resources uh, Committee in November, uh, members had asked that we would write uh, to DFA regarding uh, the installation of reflective road studs and lighting at the A5 Curl Road in the area of Crawford's Bridge, and also consideration for a slip lane on the A5 car road at the Church Road Junction. So we've uh, had a response from uh, Mr. Gallagher, the Network Development Manager. Uh, he uh, sets out within the letter uh, the department's uh, continued commitment to the delivery of the A5 Western Transport Corridor. And then within that context, uh, also comments on the provision of uh, and the need for reflective road studs. Uh, and it's confirmed there within the correspondence that uh, the, those reflective road studs will be replaced uh, when resources are available. Uh, so the, no indication as to you know, when they will actually take place, but uh, uh, certainly a confirmation that, that they will be replaced. Uh, in respect of the, uh, the request for the provision of street lighting uh, at uh, the A5 Car Road Junction with the Moyler Road, uh, the DFA have considered that with under, uh, within their uh, rural policy and uh, found that the, the uh, location wouldn't uh, meet the standards of the criteria within that policy uh, and also noted that uh, there's been a slight number of uh, app dark collisions and therefore uh, they wouldn't be providing or no intention or pro uh, provision for the provision or justification for provision of street lighting at this uh, junction. <coughs> uh, the letter uh, maybe concludes and it's maybe slightly uh, uh, cautious in terms of noting that the local transport and safety management program uh, will be presented uh, to council, uh, but is already fully committed. Uh, but they will consider the request for the slip lane uh, at Church Road, A5 Curve Road, and the development of future uh, uh, works programs within the LTSM. Uh, and said, but they do conclude, uh, or he does conclude by noting that they have limited financial and physical resources. So correspondence is uh, there to note uh, at this point in time. Okay, quite disappointing again. Uh, There's a junction I would use very frequently and, and I find that quite disappointing. I'll bring in Councillor Patrick Withers. I'm sure he'll back that up. Yep, thank you, Chair. I'll propose a note first of all, but yeah, I'd agree with that sentiment. It's disappointing that there doesn't seem to be any urgency with regards to slip lane anyway. Um, but I do know that the reflective road studs have since been renewed, so I welcome that and I want to thank DFI for the prompt action on that. But yeah, I suppose there's... Um, there's not much point now in, in writing back to them again on this matter, but hopefully we'll just keep it on the radar for now about the slip lane and um, no doubt it'll be raised in the future because it is a, a concern for road users like yourself and everybody else and local residents who have seen actions there in, uh, recently as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Patrick. Next we move to Councillor Matthew Bell. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I'll quite happily second the noting. Um, yeah, this council is very aware of just how dangerous the A5 road is. I believe it's the most dangerous road in Northern Ireland. And in fact, when I was coming into council this evening, there was a uh, flash and blue lights um, along the road. So I, I don't know the details what happened there, but if there was an accident, I hope um, everyone is as good as they can be. Um, this letter, of course, is disappointing. Um, we're not getting our street lights, and it appears that there is other work that has to be done on the A5. Um, I think accidents are going to continue on the A5 road, on um, and hopefully um, they won't get worse, but accidents will continue until we have the upgrade. Um, but I, I would like to propose then that we write to DFI, and because they mentioned in the letter that they are committed to carrying out road improvements on the existing A5, I'd actually be interested in what they are, and if if that line has any actual um, substance to it. So I'd like to propose we write to DFI and ask them to clarify uh, what improvements on the A5 they have planned and what the expected timeline is. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Matthew. And I'll bring in Councillor Emmett McAleer. 
Yeah, Chair. Uh, um, no, no, nothing different coming from this side. I think the the previous speakers have kind of nailed what's what's happening here and the, kind of the constant response that we're getting on this. Um, I'm happy enough to support the the previous proposal and Odin and and I'll second Councillor Bell there and and his request for that information. The the line I suppose that jumped out at me in this response is the the top of page two and <clears throat> this statement that there has only been a few slight after dark collisions and I would query maybe um is that um, Mr Gallagher's view on that or is that the view of the people who have been involved in these slight after dark collisions that he refers to? Again, it's the the same the same line coming back that these things are are being considered but. There, there's not the money there to do it. And this idea that until there's a fatality or until there's a serious incident and in road or um, areas where we need improved security and improved safety measures, they're just being ignored. And it really isn't good enough, this idea that until there, there's a family with a loved one not returning home, that's when we'll look at it. Prevention is the best medicine. We need to get ahead of this, and and how we do that, that's the million dollar question. But um, again, it's just one of those responses that I, I don't doubt the sincerity behind it, but I think the the overall impact and the overall response that we're getting really just isn't good enough. It leaves a lot to be desired. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Emmett. Finally, bringing in Councillor Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Chair. Um. I'd just like to re reiterate what the previous speakers have said. But the letter also itself is, con is contradictory. They talk about, yes, they are committed to improving the road. They're talking about these road improvements. But then the other hand, they're saying, we'll only do it if resources are available. So surely that, how can you improve something if the, resor if the resources are not going to be made available? So you have contradictory contradictory victory messages been given out by this letter. Again, I'm very, very disappointed. This is an area where there's been a number of collisions and we don't want to see any more serious collisions on this area, on this road. So I think we need to be putting pressure again onto road service to try and do something. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, you've heard the proposal to note the correspondence and also the proposal by Councillor Bell, seconded by Councillor McAleer. Anybody contrary to that? No, so not seeing anybody indicating, so we can move on. And uh, now we got the item. Where are we at? Right. So we're at item 10, any urgent and relevant business. I. I been notified of two items, and uh, one of them I was notified of uh, yesterday afternoon, and the other came in this evening. And I'm going to apologise to Councillor McCaffrey. Um, it came in after six o'clock, and I made a ruling at this when I first took this chair that I wouldn't take any other business after six o'clock. I realise the importance of the matter that you want to raise. However, I do not think it's going to be dealt with expediently, and and I hopefully you can bring it to another committee or back before before this the matter is resolved. So I apologise to you for Chris for not accepting it, but I made the ruling, and I'm going to stick by that. The other item was Councillor Barton wanted to bring in an item on the road signs, so I'm going to bring her in now. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, tonight, um, I think we've listened to quite a lot of discussion in relation to street naming and road signs and the exorbitant cost that these street naming, this new street naming with dual language is going to cost this council and its rate, rate payers. But I, I would like to take a step back from that. I'm a new councillor now in mid Tyrone, and obviously over the past month or so, I've been out and about in the area. And I must, I must say, I'm totally amazed by the number of roads that do not have road signs. And I, I understand, in speaking to my, my colleague, uh, Councillor Wilson, he has, brought this up, he has brought this to the attention of this council. And I'm wondering what progress there has been made and what progress will be made in getting these road signs replaced 
before the end of this financial year because we've got to think these are extremely important. The blue light services depend on these road signs to, to if there's an ambulance, if there's a fire brigade, to find an address. And I think it's something this council needs to pay a lot more attention to than it has in relation to street signs missing, road signs missing. Thank you, Rosemary. I'm going to bring in Officer John News on this. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank the member for the question. Uh, in terms of any uh, missing road signs, uh, obviously the, we, we have a, a programme of rollout of, of dual language signs and uh, there's significant resources being uh, invested in the, the, the installation of those signs. Uh, and in some of the instances where uh, signs are, are may be missing, uh, the installation of dual language uh, road signs may address that. Uh, if there are other roads in, in uh, the meantime that are missing signs, uh, if those are reported to us, uh, we record those on to uh, our asset management system and uh, those are those are addressed and those are progressed uh, as we work through the priorities uh, within the uh, the overall management of our assets and, and estates and uh, like anything it, it, it is as you know it's always subject to the the prioritization of the resources that are available uh, to us so obviously we're prioritizing uh, works and uh, staff time around uh, urgent health and safety and uh, emergency works to ensure that uh, health and safety is maintained. But I recognise uh, the importance of the road signs, as you've said, in terms of uh, whether it's delivery drivers or, uh, you know, more importantly, the uh, blue light uh, services being able to respond. So, where we're, uh, if there are specific roads that you know that uh, that you're referring to, I'm happy to pick those up uh, with any member, uh, you know, after the meeting by emails and we'll make sure that those are uh, that those are recorded onto Concerto under our asset management system and then we will replace them, you know, on a rolling programme. There's an ongoing programme of replacing those, but it, like anything, it does take time and sometimes signs can be replaced and, you know, literally within a matter of hours sometimes or a matter of days, uh, depending on the junction and depending on the location, they can become damaged and that's often down to to the size of the vehicles that are using <coughs> that are using those junctions, uh, it's le less frequently. It may be down to a collision or a, a, like a, a, an RT uh, an RTC, uh, but a lot of the time it can be down to uh, larger vehicles, whether it's uh, delivery vehicles, uh, lorries, agricultural vehicles turning uh, onto uh, narrow roads and, and clipping them at the corner, and that's just down to where, where the signs have to be uh, positioned. Thank, thank you for that response. But can I ask, do the council not have an audit process in relation to checking their signs, say at least once every six months or so? We we wouldn't we wouldn't have the resources to go out check and there there are literally you're talking about thousands upon thousands of signs and so it's what that would require would be somebody driving around the district on a non-stop basis and have, even from the point of view of this was of of climate change and sustainability it wouldn't be I wouldn't I wouldn't think it would be an effective use of our staff time what we do rely on and what we are looking is uh, how we can respond or how can we, we can improve our uh, response uh, to issues that are identified by either elected members or you know by residents across the district because th they are our best eyes and ears in terms of, of identifying damage signs uh, and certainly so that's why so as, as they reported to us they do get recorded onto the asset management system and uh, we replace them you know as we as we get to them in terms of the prioritization of the resources but no we, we wouldn't have a system in place uh, to send somebody out around on a on a rolling basis it would take much longer than, than six months uh, I, I i can't remember the figures uh, i know from a, a previous paper we had uh, I'd reported the, you know, the number of roads and the, the mileage or the kilometres of roads within the district, uh, but it, it is in the, it's thousands uh, of, of miles uh, of uh, road network or thousands of kilometres, certainly, of road network across the district. Uh, in terms of the, the identification of damage signs is very much down to uh, members of the public, public and residents' alertness to it. Thank you again for that. And I'm just saying there are, I came across a dozen and a half signs missing. Just one drive out, so. Okay, thank you. Um, I think this matters that under any other business has been concluded. Councillor Barton has raised it and the officers indicated the actions that we have to take as councillors and as residents. So I'm not going to take any other input on this matter of any other business. 
uh, if anybody has any signs that they wish to report broken or anything, then they can forward those to the re relevant uh, department. So thank you. Sorry. Uh, I'm not going to give a list of signs, don't worry. Um, no, it's, it's just a, it's just a, a question. Um, we've we've had a confusion around um, signs not only need replaced, but sometimes they get dirty and they need to clean if they have moss growing over them or whatever. Is there a, is it our, could you outline like whose responsibility is it? And is there a different responsibility between road signs, as you see on roads, and then like traffic management signs, like speed signs and things? Are, are they... A different uh, is that DFI as opposed to us, or who is that responsibility? Council's responsibility would be in respect of the the road name uh, and uh, signage, uh, other signs in terms of uh, directional signage, uh, speed indicators. Uh, that would be the responsibility of DFI roads. Okay. Thank you, uh, Seamus. Uh, you heard my spiel on what you can bring up what you can't allow Matthew in there with a, with a, a side question. So I'm not going to allow you in on a similar. Thanks, Chair. Uh, um, no, what I just wanted to ask you on, you would see in there that uh, when Steins reported that action was taken, uh, it's just to, I don't want to embarrass him around but I reported a sign two years ago. I then reported it again a year ago. I drove past it there the other day and it still isn't fixed. So. That's two year time scale. Is uh, would that be standard, uh, John, or or what would the time scale for fixing be? Uh, <clears throat> I I can't comment on the with I suppose to give you an assurance on the the time frame to replace individual signs. I will certainly pick up uh, that you know that, that query with you, uh, Councillor Green, uh, after the meeting in terms of that particular one. Uh, the we, we would aim to replace uh, signs as quickly as possible but i say it is it is always subject to prioritization of resources uh, and i said there may also be uh, some roads where there, there's work then planned uh, particularly over the last uh, year in terms of uh, dual language uh, signs being installed uh, onto certain roads i say I, 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 with, I would happy to pick up the specifics of the road you're talking about uh, after the meeting if, if you're content with that you happy with that, Seamus? That's fairly fair. Uh, that's uh, the, the, I think word for word the same answer I got twelve months ago. So um, I don't know whether I'm happy or not, but uh, I guess I'm going to have to make do. Uh, here. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Steve, uh, Councillor Stephen McCall. I'm going to allow you in briefly as well, as I've allowed uh, others in, even though I said I wouldn't. Okay, thank you, Chair. Be very brief. No, it's just in relation to Councillor Barton's point about the the council uh, maybe going around and inspecting roads to see what signs could be damaged. And I hear the response in terms of we don't have the capacity to do that. But our bin lorries are out on these roads weekly. You know, all the roads and districts been covered on a weekly basis. Is there any is there any input uh, existing at the moment where our refuge teams could notify us of any missing or damaged signs, or has that been done? And if not, is it something that could be done whenever our teams are already out and about? You know, see a broken sign or damaged sign, notify the team and, and have it on the system. Thank you, Stephen. I'll pass back to John here. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, my, we do. I, I, I know. I, I give the specific example of reports coming in from elected members and from residents, but uh, we also, I mean, those reports also come in from our staff here, out and, across, out and about across the district, uh, not just on our uh, refuge collection, but you know, all of our staff who would be out and about and uh, trying. You know, we. we we would try to work uh, so as collaboratively across uh, you know all directorates and uh, we have staff out across the district on a, a day and daily basis and as they become aware of issues those will be reported back and can be reported back in uh, onto the, the system okay thank you john i'm going to close this matter up now so we're going to move on now i'm going to ask for somebody to pr propose we go into committee as councillor robert Irvine and seconded by councillor alex baird so uh, if you
Okay, that's our side of committee. Uh, so, go to Director John News to sum up uh, the uh, business conducting on our committee. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. While in committee, uh, the uh, members considered the uh, confidential minutes from the uh, from the previous Environment Services Committee on. In, in December, and there were no matters arising. Uh, members also considered a number of confidential estate matters uh, and uh, approved the recommendations within the paper as proposed. Okay. You, you've heard that uh, proposed to adopt. Uh, no, we don't need that. No. I'll stay wrong. Okay. Yeah, I need somebody to. So, Councillor Roy Crawford and seconded by Councillor Matthew Bell. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. I probably got a nosebleed. This is the first time I've finished anywhere close to not being at ten o'clock. So thank you.